would like for you to open up your Bibles with me to the book of Galatians. And we are going to, Lord willing, finish up our series on the fruit of the Spirit. We have approximately three fruits left. Three virtues of the Christian life. Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Found in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And so I hope this week to look at faithfulness. So we'll be looking at Galatians 5, and I'm actually going to read verses 6, and then I'm going to go down to verse 22, and I'm going to read to verse 24 to get uh, the broad idea of what the Apostle Paul is saying, to refresh our memories of the context. So at verse 16, the Apostle writes these words. He says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. And then in verse 22, he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And listen to what verse 24 has to say. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Let us pray that God would bless His Word as it goes forth. Sovereign Lord, I ask that Your Word would have a, a threefold effect as it goes forth, that Your people would be encouraged, that unconverted souls would be saved, and that You would be brought glory honor and praise through the preaching of the word that Christ is a Savior would be exalted. And Father, I ask that you would aid me by the power of your Holy Spirit to preach your word. Lord God, we worship you for your love and your grace and your faithfulness toward us. For that is the only way that we ourselves can be faithful is in light of your faithfulness. So glory to the faithful God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen and amen. So the title of this sermon is Christian Virtues, as we continue that series, and obviously we're looking at faithfulness. So Christian Virtues, faithfulness is what we're looking at. In the next book in the canon of Scripture, in Ephesians 5, and you don't have to turn there, but in Ephesians 5.1, the Apostle Paul gives a very straightforward exhortation to the Ephesians. He says there in verse 1 of Ephesians 5, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Brethren, we are called to follow in the footsteps of our Father. We are called to be like Him, to imitate Him. We are called to a high calling. That is a calling of holiness, of consecration, of purity unto the Lord. We are not only called to walk into the foot, in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we are also called to walk in the footsteps of the saints who have lived before us. To recall how they have been faithful unto the Lord and how we can be likewise. Men and women who were mighty in the faith, who consistently served our God, even amidst the trials and storms of life. We are, as the text reads in, in Ephesians 5.1, little children, beloved children. Though it may be in, imperfectly, and indeed it is, we are still trying to imitate our Father. For we love Him and adore Him. He has called, to glory, he has called us to glorify Him by being faithful as He is faithful. Full of faith, trustworthy, loyal, all in the servanthood that God has placed us in. For we are all slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that faithfulness to which we have been called is what I want to turn your attention to this morning. And that is that faithfulness that is spoken of here in verse 22. But before we look at the text specifically, I want us to obtain a proper understanding of the context. I want us to grasp what the argument is that the Apostle is putting forth. And that main argument is, in the whole book of Galatians, 
is simply this. The believer does not have to keep the law of Moses to be saved. See, in Galatia, there was a, a particular group of Jewish, quote-unquote, Christians who said that in order to be a true Christian or a true follower of Christ, what one must do is they must keep the law. Specifically, they must be circumcised, which signified someone being under the Old Covenant, which signified someone being obligated to keep the law. That was the charge, or you could say the command, that these Judaizers were placing before the Galatians. They were troubling the Galatians because they were stripping them of any assurance of salvation and laying before them legalism. And Paul systematically, thoroughly, straightforwardly destroys that lie in the book of Galatians. Specifically in chapters 2 through 4. And even he talks about that in chapter 1 and even bleeds over into chapter 5. It saturates the matter of this book. In fact, Galatians is very much like the book of Romans in the fact that they are both about one simple truth. And that is that salvation is by faith alone. It is apart from the works of the law. It is apart from religious performance. It is a free gift of God. Even as we ourselves saw this morning in the book of John, our precious Lord Jesus, teaching on salvation, declaring it to be a divine gift from God, only by the agency of the Holy Spirit. And here in chapter 5, the Apostle Paul comes, comes about into a spirit of exhortation. It is a spirit of direct command. After giving the the you could say the doctrinal truth, he now brings it into the practical. To give you a little bit of an idea of the structure of chapter 5, in verses 1 through 26, the whole chapter is really about this one thing, is to walk in the Spirit. Because the ministry of the Holy Spirit is not to put us under the law, it's to write it in our hearts. It's to enable us to fulfill the law. And the first part of, of the chapter 5, the first section, chapter 5 really breaks up into three parts very evenly. The first part is concerning circumcision. And the Apostle Paul systematically approaches the idea of circumcision. And I can succinctly put it that he says circumcision is of no benefit to you. Is of no benefit to you. You don't need it to be saved. And then he comes upon in verse 13 through 15. And he proclaims to the, to the Galatians, to love one another. That love fulfills the law. In fact, he says in verse 14, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that's a very important phrase. That's a very important concept. And he will further elaborate on that as the chapter progresses. And then the third part of chapter 5 is on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. In fact, your Bibles might actually break that into a separate, uh, separate uh, paragraph. I know the mind does here, at the beginning of verse 16 and all the way to verse 25. It's its own section of Scripture. And he talks about the, the Holy Spirit's ministry, and he begins with the idea that the Holy Spirit and the flesh are at war in the, in the believers' members. In fact, in verse 17, listen to what he says, For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But then verse 18 reveals a very key truth. Verse 18, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. It is not that the believer who has the Spirit of God is free from moral obligation. But see, it is the believer who is under the Spirit of God who is truly free from the law. In the sense that the law no longer is an external entity saying do this and don't do this. Instead, it has been written upon his heart and the Spirit enables him to fulfill it. For one cannot truly love their neighbor as themselves. One cannot truly love God apart from the agency and the enabling of the Holy Spirit. The outer law does not give life, but it simply shows that we abide in death outside of Christ. That is the argument he is giving. And then in, he continues in verses 19 through 21, he gives the, the deeds of the flesh. And then in verses 22 through 23, the precious fruit of the Spirit. 
And then he ends the chapter off by another exhortation in verse 25. If you're going to live by the Spirit, you need to walk by the Spirit. In other words, if you say that you have the Holy Spirit, you're going to walk in accordance to that claim. And then he ends off with an interesting phrase in verse 26. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Now that takes us back to what he had said in verse 14. That the law is fulfilled in loving one's neighbor. See, the argument, like I said, is that we do, know, we do not need the outward law to tell us this. The Spirit gives it. The Spirit instructs the heart. The Spirit instructs the mind. And so one of the things the Holy Spirit instructs us concerning is Christian faithfulness. Is how to be loyal. How to be faithful and consistent in our walk with the Lord. And in our dealings with our fellow men. That is only by the ministry and the power of the Holy Spirit. And why is this economy set up this way? Why is it is arranged in such a manner? It is to bring God the glory. It is to exalt the God who gave us the Spirit of God. Oh, dear brethren, God is indeed jealous for His own glory. And He will bring it to pass that He is glorified in the end of all things. And so now that we have a good understanding of Paul's argumentation, where he's coming from, and what he is wanting to say, we can now zoom in on faithfulness itself as the attribute that we are holding today. And so we're going to look at the faithfulness of the Christian. The faithfulness of the Christian. And the first thing I would like to see is the command concerning faithfulness. The command. In verse 22, as it reads, but the fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. This is the imperative through chapter, through the entire chapter, through chapter 5. In fact, uh, verse 1 really states, he's, this is an exhortation. This whole chapter is about him exhorting the Galatians. That's why he says in verse 1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject to Again, to a yoke of slavery. Oh, dear brethren, how free we are in Christ. Free to walk in obedience to the law. Not out of duty. Not out of a sense of, of slavery. Not out of a sense of, if I do not do, do not do this, I'm condemned. But out of a sense of freedom to fulfill it. As Romans 8 testifies, that we have fulfilled the law. We are walking in fulfillment of the law by the power of the Spirit. And as we already looked at in verse 14 and even 13 of the chapter, in verse 16, he says again, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. And even verse 25 is also a command by implication. Because he says if you walk by the Spirit, if you say you live by the Spirit and you do not walk, walk by it, then you truly do not walk by the Spirit. As I said earlier, it fits the basic structure of Paul's writing. That he begins with a, with a doctrinal explanation. And then he brings it into the practical. That's exactly chapters 1 through 4 is a doctrinal explanation. And then chapters 5 and 6 is a practical application. This is very characteristic of not only this book in particular, but almost all of Paul's literature. Ephesians, for example, uh, the first three chapters is all rich doctrine and theology. But then, in verse, uh, excuse me, chapters four through six, we see it, we see the apostle Paul brings it into the practical. And here in verse twenty-two of Galatians five, the command is implied because, as we said earlier, as I saw, or as, excuse me, as I pointed out a moment ago, in verse sixteen, he says, "Walk by the Spirit," and then he tells us in verse twenty-two how that is done. It's not only the Apostle Paul who commands, obviously, faithfulness. It's not only Paul's writing. Not that it's not inspired. We obviously know that all Scripture is inspired and evenly authoritative. But just to give you a little bit of a, a sampling, Jesus told the church at Smyrna in Revelation 2.10, listen to these words from our Lord. He told them through the Apostle John, He said, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, 
so that you will be tested. And you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now that's a pretty scary charge from the Lord in the sense that you can imagine being in the, the shoes of the believers at Smyrna, thinking Satan is going to come after us and throw us in prison. They're about to undergo intense persecution. Intense hardship. Perhaps like that which Job went through. For we know that Satan afflicted Job. But nonetheless, in the midst of their hardship, Jesus commands that they must be faithful. And he even says, until death. Also, the book of Proverbs. Just to give you an Old Testament text. In chapter 28, verse 20. It says simply, a faithful man will abound with blessings. God honors faithfulness, and he blesses a faithful man. As I said, that is simply a sampling. Surely we could go and, and survey all of Scripture and what it has to say concerning both the faithfulness of the believer and also the faithfulness of God. But time will certainly flee from us very quickly if we were to do that. So we will continue on. Our Master and Lord... Our five-star general, our great commander, he gives us the charge. We are the soldiers on the battlefield, brethren. In fact, right now, we're sitting really in a place, a bunker, preparing for battle. And when this place is dismissed, when this time of worship is dismissed, we go back into the battlefield, and we step out into the world. And the Lord, through his word this day, is giving us the charge. Be faithful unto death. As we go out into battle, and may we be faithful for the Lord Jesus Christ. Even when, we're, even when we are in the intensity of a battle with the enemy, when we are in the midst of spiritual warfare, when our very lives are at stake, when our very lives are at stake, like the, the Puritan, or excuse me, like the, uh, the Protestants in the early Reformation, who were persecuted for believing the gospel message. When we were persecuted, like the believers in the early church, many, who, many of whom were killed for their faith in Christ, May we be found faithful because our commander has commanded it. Our master has sent forth the command. Fight the good fight. We are called to have fidelity. We are called to be trustworthy. We are called to have constancy. We are called to adhere to our Lord with the uttermost allegiance. We have sworn allegiance to our Lord Jesus Christ. We have dedicated ourselves unto service to Him. There is no turning back. For even though we know that even we could face death for what we believe, we could face the most horrible persecution and hardship in this life, yet we know the promise comes from our Lord's lips, and I will give you the crown of life. How precious that is to our hearts. Let us carry that with us into the battle. Let us carry that with us in our bosom. That in the heat of the battle, we might look down and remember the words that our Lord spoke. As with the other fruits, which we have looked at and surveyed, this can only be obtained by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, brethren, not only does God send us forth into the battlefield to simply remember His words, but He has sent forth His Holy Spirit to dwell in us to remind us of those words, to bring to our recollection those precious words our Lord spoke. This is a ministry of the Holy Spirit to produce this fruit in us. It's by His grace alone. It's by His grace alone. But you may ask, what does this faithfulness look like in His people? I mean, we obviously know in a very generic sense what faithfulness is, but how does Scripture define biblical Christian faithfulness? And that leads me to the next point I'd like to make, and that is the characteristics of Christian faithfulness. The characteristics of Christian faithfulness. And firstly, I would like to turn your attention to the first one, and that being that it is long-lasting. That it is long-lasting. Jesus our Lord said in Matthew 10, 22, he said, you will be hated by all because of my name. 
but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. That's a long-lasting event. That's a long-lasting practice, brethren. Our lives, some of us, have many, many years ahead. And the Lord calls us to endure, to abide with Him. It is also worthy to note, as we look at this passage, that Jesus does not promise an easy life to us, brethren. He does not promise health or wealth or prosperity, but He promises hardship. In fact, He even says, you will be hated by all because of my name. In fact, the scripture says elsewhere that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. The book of Matthew also has more to say on this. Jesus said in Matthew twenty-two thirteen, 13, he said, the one who endures to the end will be saved. It is almost an exact replication of what was spoken in Matthew 10, 22. Surely, the gospel writer, Matthew, wanted, wanted us to understand that this was a pivotal teaching of the Lord Jesus. It was an important teaching of our Lord. That we are to remain faithful. That we are to endure. We all know dear saints who have served the Lord for many years. And we can all attest to the fact that their faith is so much of an encouragement to ours. That their faith, that their constancy to the Lord, their allegiance their loyalty to their maker through the years of their life, through the decades perhaps, refreshes our souls and it spurs us to further faithfulness. In fact, not only believers whom we know in person, but even believers whom we see down the halls of church history. One of which is a man by the name of John Calvin, one of the great reformers he was converted at the age of 24, and he served the Lord for the rest of his life. He died quite early, died a premature uh, death, you could say. He, he only lived about 31 years after that, but he served the Lord vigorously. In fact, two years after he was converted, he wrote one of the, the classics of the Christian faith called The Institutes of the Christian Religion. In fact, that book is uh, the seminary which I have been received to, the Bible college uh, that I've been received to, when I work through that Bible college and then I go on a seminary, Lord willing, that will be one of the books that I have to study. Study so much that I actually have, will have to outline it and write an extensive paper on that very book. Two years after his conversion. And he wrote many other books and he preached thousands of sermons. In fact, I was reading just last night concerning John Calvin's ministry. And he would preach every Lord's Day morning from the New Testament. And then he would preach every Lord's Day evening, either from a New Testament passage or a psalm. And then throughout the week, I think it was about five days out of the week, he would preach an Old Testament text every day of the week in the morning. He was faithful to the pulpit. He was faithful to serve his master. Another example of faithfulness is a man by the name of Dr. John MacArthur, who is actually still alive. He was converted at a very young age, and he became the pastor of what is called Grace Community Church out in California, back in February of 1969. To give you a little perspective, that was months before my father was even born. And since coming to Grace Community Church, he has accomplished one of the feats that very few pastors accomplish. That being that he has preached through the entire New Testament, verse by verse, word for word. In fact, I think it was he made it through the book of Romans in 10 years. He spent 25 years going through the Gospels. Talk about detailed exposition. He was, he's been faithful to preach, and even now he preaches weekly. Continued. He's, wrote, he's written dozens of books. Been all around the world preaching the Gospel. These men and men like them, and even women of the faith, ought to be a great encouragement to us, brethren, that we ought to have long-lasting faithfulness. That is the essence of faithfulness, that it lasts a long time. If it doesn't, it's not faithfulness, it's faithlessness. Brethren, we are betrothed unto the Lord Jesus Christ. We are a part of the bride. What would you think of a bride? 
who was unfaithful to her husband. It'd be a disgrace. It'd be an embarrassment for her. But how often do we find ourselves straying from our Lord? As the betrothed of the Lord Jesus Christ, how this grieves Him that we ourselves are unfaithful. The second aspect of Christian faithfulness is that it is self-denying. That it is self-denying. If you would turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 9, and you can follow along with me here in Luke 9. Jesus has some very interesting words in Luke 9. And this plays into the life of a, of a faithful Christian. He begins in verse 23. He says, If anyone is to come after me, he must deny himself. Take up his cross daily and come after me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Verse 26. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Brethren, in order to be truly faithful in our work, we must be self-denying. How often do we find ourselves tempted by the flesh, tempted by the world, to commit sin? That takes self-denial. That takes, in that moment, for us to say, no, I will live for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I will let go of myself. I will forget about myself. I will forget about my passions. I will forget about these lusts that are raging within my members. And I will live to the glory of God. As it is written in 1 Corinthians 10.31, do all that you do to the glory of God. Faithfulness is not easy. Any of you who have been married for any length of time, you will know this. Faithfulness to a spouse is not an easy task. It takes hard work. It takes diligence to love that person in good times and bad, for better or for worse. And it is likewise with our Lord. Not that He is sometimes better or sometimes worse, but it is that sometimes we are better and sometimes we are worse. It is not like climbing or traversing a little hill. It is taking upon ourselves the great feat of traversing the Everest. It is something that is great, but can only be done by the power of God which dwells in us. That is why the Apostle Paul in Galatians 2, earlier in the book, he says in verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. The Christian life, faithfulness, is not something Christians do. It's something God does in them. Because he continues that verse and he says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Brother, do you want to know the secret to the Christian life in general and then, of course, to Christian faithfulness in specifics? It is self-death. That it is relying upon the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who can enable us to be faithful. Because he was perfectly faithful. Think about his life. Think about his ministry. We see in Matthew 4, what happens? Jesus is tempted by Satan. Three times tempted. And every time he was potently faithful. Powerfully faithful unto the Lord God of hosts. He was so faithful, in fact, he could say in Matthew 5, in the next chapter, in verse 17, that he did not come to the lost law, but he came to fulfill it. And we know that he came, and he did that very thing. Praise be to the Lord of hosts. That his dear son has come and has exemplified faithfulness for us. Continuing on, the third aspect of faithfulness, or the attribute of faithfulness, you could say, is that it is God honoring. It is a God honoring act. This, as we have already seen, is commanded. And therefore, when we are doing it out of obedience to the Lord, out of a desire to please him, it glorifies him. And not only that, but it reflects Him. It reflects His character. It reflects Christ's character, who is our light. Jesus is our light, dear brethren. He is our perfect example. 
He is the one who illuminates our path. In fact, uh, Matthew 5, 14, listen to what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. This light that is supposed to shine is not our own, but it is the Lord. It is of the Lord. It is His light that we shine. And that is why it can say, that is why the text reads there at the end, it will glorify your Father who is in heaven. Why? Because He is the Father of lights, as James 1.17 says. There is a consistency there. We reflect the light of God's glorious character. The light of God's faithfulness toward His people when we are obedient to be faithful. It is a very high calling indeed. Very high. Think of a king who rules over a kingdom. His servants adore him. They want to honor him so that he is honored in them and that he is glorified in them. That he is exalted and praised. They want to walk in obedience to him. How much more should we, as slaves of Christ, have that same attitude in ourselves? Do you honor God in faithfulness? Do you honor God in loyalty? If not, you need to repent, brethren. You need to repent. The fourth attribute I would like to see concerning faithfulness speaks of its manifestation. That is the direction in which it points. And that is that it is toward fellow man. It is toward other people. That would be the fourth attribute that I'd like to look at. The context, as we saw at the beginning, makes that abundantly clear. As we saw in verse 14 of Galatians 5, Paul says, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's a very key phrase as we saw in the chapter there. It really states his premise are we loyal? Are we trustworthy? Are we committed to the well-being of others, and specifically other Christians? There is a level of faithfulness that we are to show toward unbelievers, but there is even a higher level that we are to show in terms of our faithfulness toward Christians. There's even a greater calling in that respect. Are we above reproach in this, in this way? In fact, Paul goes on in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. He goes on to say, Bear one another's burdens. And thereby fulfill the law of Christ. And then in uh, verses 9 and 10 of that same chapter, he says, Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Brethren, God has called us to lay our lives down to serve our brethren, and we do that by being faithful to them. Trustworthy. Think about it, brethren. If we reflect this toward one another, when one of us goes through a trial, one of us goes through a hard time, we will know that we can call up one another and we will be praying for one another. We will bear that burden together. <clears throat> Notice here again he says, let us not grow weary. He's echoing what he said in chapter 5 there. That we are not to grow weary in doing good. And that, that speaks to the aspect of faithfulness. It's continual. We don't grow weary. We endure it. We continue. We self-deny. And we glorify God in that. In fact, Matthew Henry, the famed Bible commentator, said about this verse, specifically verse 22, uh, Galatians 5, he says, it's so short, but it's so succinct, so powerful. He says, faith, fidelity, justice, and honesty in what we profess and promise to others. Very, very true that is. The fifth manifestation, the fifth attribute of our faithfulness is that it is toward our great God. Surely this is the greatest manifestation of faithfulness. Faithfulness to God and His commandments. 
In fact, David charged Solomon toward the end of David's life and the beginning of Solomon's reign. He said in verse 3 of 1 Kings 2, he said, Keep charge of the Lord your God and walk in His ways to keep His statutes, His commandments, His ordinances, and His testimonies according to what is written in the law of Moses that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn. Brethren, there is blessing. There is blessing upon us when we are walking in obedience to the Lord. There may not necessarily be a material blessing or an unearthly carnal blessing, no. But that's not true blessedness. The blessedness from the Lord that we obtain is holiness and purity, intimacy with God. The one who is closest to God is the one who is most like God. The one who is walking in obedience to His commands. Our Lord Jesus, in accordance to what David said, said in Luke 9, 62, He said, No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. The purpose of our faithfulness is faithfulness to the cause of Christ, to the expanse of His kingdom, to the preaching of the gospel. Brethren, this is to go out into all the world. That sinners might be reconciled to the Savior. That they might be born again from above. As we saw this morning. That the Spirit might convict them of their sin. In 1 Timothy 1, Paul says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because He considered me faithful, putting me into service. Can you say the Lord considers you worthy? Can you say the Lord considers you faithful? <coughs> Can you say the Lord Jesus will look upon you and say, He or she is my faithful servant, my loyal servant? In fact, as we saw in the beginning, church history is filled with stories and accounts of soldiers of the cross being faithful to death. As we contemplate men like John Huss, a man who was killed for believing the gospel message. As we contemplate someone like Jim Elliot, who was a missionary to South America and was killed by a tribal group as he was trying to proselytize them, as he was trying to bring the gospel to them. As we can contemplate other brethren, even ones right now who are dying in the Middle East, who are being persecuted in Somalia, who are being persecuted in Iran, who are being persecuted in Afghanistan, who are being persecuted in North Korea, who are being persecuted in China, who are sitting in those prison camps, who are about to lose their lives for the gospel message. As we contemplate their faithfulness to the Lord, can we say we have and possess such a faithfulness? Brethren, persecution is coming. This nation, this Western culture, in which we find ourselves is becoming more and more and more and increasingly anti-Christian. In fact, a lot of people who survey the culture call it a post-Christian society. And it will come soon. We've seen it even in recent years with the punishing of that baker, or the cake maker, excuse me, in Oregon, who refused to make a cake for a gay wedding and was penalized for it and lost their business? It's coming, brethren. That's only the start. It's a very small amount. It's just going to increase. As our Lord promised, things would only get worse over time until His return. We need to be prepared to be faithful to death. To death for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Brethren, I also want to exhort you to this. People love, or I should say people are most faithful to that which they most love. Men love sports, they're faithful to their sports team. Women love shopping, they're faithful to go shopping. But how many truly love and value God and show it by their faithfulness? I don't, I don't mean say I love God. How for some of you who claim to be followers of Christ, Claim to be followers, yet not faithful whatsoever. In fact, you find yourselves loving the sports more and loving the shopping more, loving the food more, loving whatever else that you worship in your life. 
aside from the Lord God of hosts, and not a stranger. You're most to be pitied for your hypocrisy, and you are to repent and believe the gospel. You are in the most dangerous position for you are self-deceived. Convincing yourself to be a Christian, but telling yourself you're saved, but truly are not. You can tell what you are truly loyal to by what you spend your time on, by what you think about, what excites your soul? What excites your heart? For that is what you worship. Dr. John MacArthur, whom I referenced earlier, said rightly in his commentary on Galatians, he said, concerning faithfulness, the servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God are to be like their Lord, is being found trustworthy. We are to be like our Lord in being found trustworthy. See, brethren, if we are to see revival in our lives, in our families, in this church, in this county, we must be faithful unto the Lord, faithful in the diligent study of the Word, faithful in the memorization of the Word, faithful in prayer, faithful in evangelism, faithful in corporate worship, faithful in family worship. If we want to see revival, if we want to see souls brought into the kingdom, if we want to see God's blessing pour down from heaven. We must be faithful. For God is looking for faithful men and women to use for His purposes. God invites us to be a part of His, of His redemptive plan in history by being faithful instruments in His hand. Brethren, He does not need to use an unholy and unfaithful minister of the gospel. In fact, he can in his sovereignty. He can use them. But he has so many more godly and righteous men and women at his disposal. Brethren, let, let us not pass up this opportunity to be used by the Lord. For he can raise up rocks to bring him glory. He can raise up the trees and the birds of the air to proclaim the gospel if he wanted to. Let us not look back at the end of our lives and say, I lived the easy Christian life. I lived the Southern Baptist typical Christian life. I lived the Americanized Christian life. I lived the lukewarm Christian life. And said, can we say with the Apostle Paul, I have fought the good fight. I have ran the course. I finished the race. Oh, how often we find ourselves being unfaithful. But when we are faithful to the Lord. What are the results? That's the question. And that is what else I would like. That is the next thing I would like to look at. The results of faithfulness to God. And as I mentioned already before, it brings God glory. And that is our chief end. That's the whole purpose of our creation and our salvation is to bring God glory. But I want to put this in the negative so you'll see what happens when we are unfaithful. When we are unfaithful, it dishonors God. It brings Him no glory, but it grieves the Holy Spirit of God. And that's truly a sad place to be in. As a believer walking about this life, living the lukewarm, Americanized, typical Southern Baptist Christian life, and to grieve the Spirit of God. Oh, that we might desire intimacy with God more than we desire the praise of men, more than we desire the pleasures of this life, that we might be faithful to Him. Surely, He is not glorified in our disobedience, brethren. David is a very profound example of this. We all are familiar with David's story of his falling into sin with Bathsheba. We obviously know how he was unfaithful. He even murdered a man, murdered her husband. So he could take her as his wife. We know from 2 Samuel 12, 14, this is when Nathan the prophet comes to, to David and rebukes him by the power of God concerning his sin with Bathsheba. He says this to David, however, because by this deed, you, listen to this, you have given to the enemies of the Lord to 
blasphemy. Child also that is born to you shall surely die. Brother, not only does it dishonor God and surely does not bring him glory, it causes the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme when we are unfaithful. And that is why it grieves me and it angers me to the utmost to see person after person after person out there on the streets, even in churches, who claim to be a Christian and they're false converts, they're clearly condemned, they're clearly lost, they're clearly hypocrites. It makes me angry at such people because they drag the name of the Lord Jesus Christ through the mud. In fact, I would be very pleased if they went around telling everyone they weren't a Christian. I would. I'd rather them recant their claim to Christ than claim Christ and drag His name through the mud. What is one of the commandments? One of the Ten Commandments? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That is precisely what someone is doing when they claim to be a Christian. They are taking the name of Christ upon themselves. For His very name is in the word Christian. They are a follower of Him. And yet when they act the way that they do, when they act as hypocrites, when they show their true colors, show where their heart is before God, how they blaspheme the Lord, they do great damage to the cause of Jesus Christ. In fact, it, is, well, it has been well said, the greatest threat to American Christianity is not Islam, is not North Korea or China, is not homegrown terrorists, is not any other issue you could think of. Surely the greatest issue to American Christianity is falsely converted people. People who sit in pews Pastors who step in pulpits and have never known the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is truly the greatest threat to the American Christian. This is truly the greatest threat to Christianity in America. Because when one has all the outward trappings and all the pompous display of religion, but they're dead on the inside, they are, as our Lord Jesus said, sons and daughters of hell. Brethren, let us take seriously our faithfulness to God. Let's be blaspheming Him. We ought to desire to please Him. We ought to be thankful for all that He has done for us. Not only in the Gospel, not only in what Christ has done, but even just in our lives subjectively. Perhaps we can even recall times in our lives where we were close to dying. In a car wreck or perhaps some freak accident or health issue. And yet the Lord relieved it. And spared our, us our lives. What grace. What grace. Our end is to glorify God. So let's pursue it by being faithful. The new covenant was inaugurated for this very purpose. The Lord promised through Ezekiel. Concerning the coming new covenant. He said in Ezekiel 32, or 36, 22, He says, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name. God is for God. God is for His glory. And if we want to be used by Him, then we need to be walking in obedience to Him, in faithfulness to Him. We might be used for His glory, brethren. Are any of you lacking in faithfulness? Have any of you lacked this to the Lord? Faithfulness not only toward God, but even your fellow man. You've been dishonest. You've been conniving toward both unconverted and converted souls. Has your walk with the Lord been inconsistent? then you have great need for repentance. Or perhaps any of you unbelieving, you find yourself this very day to be one of those unconverted souls. Do you find yourself never being loyal to Christ and not caring a thing about spiritual issues? Truly, surely, you are unconverted. And you need to be reconciled to the Lord God. Do not delay. We are on the precipice of eternity. At any moment, could be your moment. 151,000 people.
today will meet their maker. And many, as our Lord Jesus said in Matthew 7, are on the road to destruction. Let the somber reality of hellfire break our hearts. Yes, even those of us who are converted. Let it break our hearts for their salvation. And you who are unconverted, let it break your heart. Let it terrify you. Let the fear of the Lord press you to believe upon Christ for salvation. To look to Him as the risen Savior. So in conclusion, we have seen the faithfulness of a Christian. That it is commanded. It is an imperative. That it is characteristic by many attributes. Many, many different things. And we've even seen its results. And ultimately this faithfulness comes only by trusting in God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As we saw, it only comes by the agency of the Spirit. If you don't have the Spirit, you can't have this. But those of us who do, we have the hope. The hope. The hope of glory, because God has promised to bring us into glory. See, brethren, when we consider and we contemplate Christian faithfulness, you know what? We should always end up, at the end of our study, we should end up standing in front of the cross, remembering the faithfulness that God showed in that. For that is the chiefest and the most grand display of God's faithfulness. For He fulfills His promises. The gospel promise has been fulfilled. The Savior has come. The one who was promised in Genesis 3 is the seed of the woman. The one who was promised to Abraham in Genesis 12. The one who was promised to David in 2 Samuel 7 as the coming king. The one who was promised in Isaiah 7. The one who was promised in Isaiah 9. The one who was promised in Isaiah 52. The one who was promised in Isaiah 53. The Lord Jesus Christ is the fulfillment. He is the faithful one. He is the one who has come to fulfill His promises. And as we were able to look at last week in Isaiah 53, and to contemplate and consider how God even fulfilled the most minute of those prophecies that was put forth in Isaiah 53, even down to, as we saw, that He was with the rich man in His death, and Joseph of Arimathea buried Christ, we saw even in those ways, God kept His word. On a single word, God will ever fail. Christ's coming is that fulfillment, the gospel promise. Why did He have to come? Because God is holy, God is righteous, and separate from sinners. It is so true, He is gracious. We see it in our lives daily. Even our being here today, every breath we take is a Profound display of God's faithfulness and graciousness. But that never negates His holiness. And in His holiness, He gives His law. The forbidding of lying and thievery and blasphemy. But we find ourselves as sinners having broken this law, even from the earliest days of life. As the psalmist said, In sin did my mother conceive me. Totally, utterly, fully depraved. Haters of God, as Romans 1.30 says. Therefore we, because we've broken the law, are condemned to hell. A place of torment and agony and we're without hope. But God, in, in ages past, promised to sin the soul-crushing uh, soul seed of the woman. Lord Jesus Christ. And he came and fulfilled the law on our behalf and lived that perfect life for us and then went to the cross and was nailed to that tree and satisfied the wrath of Almighty God against sin and was raised to life on the third day. And he's alive today. And now repentance and faith is the proper reaction to the gospel. And brethren, we have already done that. The Spirit of God has enabled us to repent and believe. And so we know that the result has been upon our own souls. We've been forgiven of all sin because of Christ's atonement. And we have been wrapped in His perfect righteousness. We have been clothed in the righteousness of Christ. But for you who have yet to repent and believe, turn! Look to Him!
Him and live for eternal life. Lest you perish and you will receive forgiveness of sin. You will receive the righteousness of Christ. Come to Him and live. He will perfectly save you because He is faithful to keep His promises. Trust in the Lord to save you. He is faithful. Deuteronomy 32, 4 says, For all His ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice. Righteous and upright is He. And you, brethren, look to the cross that display of God's faithfulness. Let that break your heart. Let that make you weep. Weep in joy. We need to weep in sorrow. We need to weep in brokenness. But let us also weep in joy. Looking to the cross. And seeing our faithful God. His glory displayed. And now as we're going to move in a couple of moments. Into the time. Where we are going to commemorate. And remember the Lord Jesus. His sacrifice through the taking. Of the Lord's Supper. May we confess our sin before the Lord. In fact, in 1 John 1, 9, it speaks to God's faithfulness in terms of forgiving sin. It says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do not be discouraged, for even when you are unfaithful, He remains faithful. In fact, that is exactly what 2 Timothy 2.13 says in closing. The Apostle Paul says to Timothy, if we are faithful, excuse me, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. It is to him, the faithful God, that we are to ascribe glory and honor and praise. Indeed, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in light of these truths, I pray that our lives would be transformed by your grace and for your glory. And now as we move on to this time of taking the Lord's Supper, which is a very serious act, I pray that you would grant us each a sober spirit as we can contemplate our own lives and we consider the precious sacrifice of your dear Son upon the cross to whom belongs glory, to whom belongs honor, to whom belongs exaltation and adoration and adulation.